Welcome. Welcome. It's lovely to see lots of familiar faces and new faces. Um, welcome to the webinar about ecotherapy and forest school. I'm Louise. I'm one of the FSA directors and part of the working group that helps make these webinars. Um, you also may see some other familiar faces like John is also going to be around. Hi. <laughs> He's going to do the sharing bit at the end. And we also got the lovely Matt who's going to be busy taking notes uh, for us. And uh, of course, we're going to be talking to Robert today, but I will let him introduce himself a little bit later. Um, before we get going, Nick, our wonderful tech goblin, is going to just give us a little bit of information about Zoom protocols and how it works. So, Nick, would you be able to do that, please? Hello, everybody. Good evening. And uh, can you hear me all okay? Give me a wave. Excellent. Good, good. Starting to worry there. I've got a bit of a technical glitch. Um, yeah, for those of you who've been on Zoom before, you know what you're doing. For those of you who haven't, uh, there's some handy buttons down on the left hand side of your screen with mute and start and stop video. We are going to be recording this session tonight, so it will be available to you. If you don't want to appear on the video, then please do stop your video. Uh, and then when you ask questions, you won't appear on the screen. Um, what else do I need to tell you? At the end, we'll be going into breakout rooms um, and I'll be putting everybody into a breakout room. If you want to return to the main room to continue with Robert, um, then you need to press leave the breakout room or not join it in the first place. It depends what how Zoom's feeling as to which way round it does it. Um, so if you do end up in there and you want to come back, then press leave. And if you don't want to join, then click join later. I think it says um, that's pretty much it. Pop your questions in the chat if you've got any. Um, and uh, Matt will help by picking them out. And I think that's me. Uh... Thank you, Nick. Lovely. Um, and I think everybody's found the chat bar where you can chat to each other and uh, share your hellos and any questions that you might have that arise as we go through the material. Do feel free to put your questions in the chat bar because one of us will be monitoring it. I think John will be monitoring it and then we can pull those out for Robert to answer as we go through the material. Also, just a little reminder that Robert's got something exciting planned for us that involves paper or mark making equipment. So if you haven't got, you know, pens or crayons or pencils or something to make marks, you might want to grab some now before we get before we get going. Um, before I hand over to Robert, I'm going to give you a quick um, update from us as the Forest School Association. Um, and just to, to let you know, we have been periodically publishing um, updates around the COVID situation and how things might sit in regards to Forest School. So you can find that all from our main website, which is forestschoolassociation.org. And there is a, a COVID section there. So if you're looking for that sort of information, do check our website. Um, we've also been slowly releasing what we're calling community call-in videos which if you're on our Facebook stream or our social media streams, you might have seen some of these, which are kind of short little video clips um, designed to kind of answer common questions that you might hear as a forest school practitioner from parents or other colleagues and things like that. So um, do have a look out for those and share them if you think they would be useful within your forest school communities. Um, we're also currently updating our various policies, um, including the diversity one. So do look out if you're a member, um, we'll be releasing some updates and some statements around that. Um, and something else in the pipeline is there's currently a consultation with the government around the tree strategy. And so we would like to respond as the FSA to that consultation, which finishes in the early September. And so there is plans um, to have some consultations with membership around that. 
So again, if you're one of our members, do look out for that if you're particularly interested and want your voice to be heard around the tree strategy. Um, John has just posted a little link in the chat bar there if that's of interest to anybody. Um, and then finally, although it's a little bit secret and a little bit premature, um, do look out in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be releasing a national campaign, which we hope will support forest school leaders coming out of lockdown and other outdoor providers. Um, but it's a little bit secret because we haven't launched it yet. But again, if you're a member, do look out for that and we'll be looking for people to hopefully spread the word about this campaign. Um, but that's probably all I'm allowed to tell you. So, so, yeah, so do look out, but we hope it should be really good. And it, you know, it does involve lobbying government and things like that as well, potentially. So um, it's quite exciting and quite a big project that we've been working on. Um, so that's probably it for Forest School Association news. So without further ado, I'm going to now hand over to uh, Robert, the, the expert about, we're going to be talking about ecotherapy, eco-psychology in today's webinar. And I will let Robert introduce himself um, to you because I'm sure he'll do a better job. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> well, Robert. Well, thank you. Thanks very much, Lou. Really uh, nice to be here again. Well, I think about a month since I was last here doing some mindfulness. Um, but another another thing I'm really interested in is is ecotherapy and eco psychology. It's part of my part of my background. Just uh, basically at, at this point, I'm a I'm a psychotherapist uh, counselor as well as teaching mindfulness so I sort of basically do half and half of each of those things i run uh, mindfulness in nature days and weekends now expanding to weekends and things um so basically what sort of took me there was was uh, as a as a kid i did i i basically uh when i was having tough times i would go and spend a lot of time in nature and uh, it was just sort of a natural automatic thing to do I grew up on a farm it was easy for me to do I just went out and went on long walks or I was I got into bird watching quite young actually um, so really enjoyed uh, really thoroughly getting into nature um, and so I realized later when I uh, became an adult and went off to university that uh, my love of nature and my desire to to help people sort of can come together so uh, this is this is something that sort of uh, my part of my ma study my masters in counseling was to focus on on nature uh, as a as a way to support people's growth and healing and, and development so that's sort of what got me into this sort of uh field and direction. Um, what I've got tonight is I'll maybe maybe I'll probably do the rest in a, as a PowerPoint presentation. So I'm going to share share some ideas um, that I have around these things if I can just work out how to do it. This is a new program to me so I think I do this, I do that, I think that should, something should work. All right, okay. So, I want to start off by just sort of laying the groundwork, by looking at these words. I think there's a lot of uh, useful uh, information uh, buried in words uh, that we often sort of skim over uh, and there, there's a lot in this word eco psychology uh, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, if we look back at some of its heritage or its uh, history the word eco itself eco uh, is used in lots of ways but in its root in the Greek, at least, it basically meant a home, including the house, family, land, the people who work the land, sort of a whole homestead. You could say the sort of community, the whole community, the, you could even say the ecosystem of a, of a, of a home. 
so I feel that's quite a um, quite a handy way to start if you think about the way that the word eco is used in economy and uh, ecology all these sorts of things are, are talking about systems of, of how things are working together so that's the word eco starts off um, psyche psyche psychology psyche is, means soul so soul i'm i'm using that word uh the way i use that word is is to think about it as the deepest part of ourselves our uniqueness our blueprint you could say you could say this uh, the part of us that we're born with um, and maybe the idea here is that we might unfold that blueprint as we live into our lives so this is the idea of the soul here of course modern psychology um has pretty much done away with half of its word, half of its name, which is a little bit strange with a sort of skepticism about what, what is this thing called soul? Can you measure it? Um, if it can't be measured, maybe it doesn't exist or whatever. So we could get into that discussion later if we really want to. But uh, the way I'm using it today is just the, this sort of deepest, the deepest part of ourselves. Ology. Ologies are just things that we study. Uh, you can see the word logic in there. So we're sort of looking at uh, a dynamic logic of, of uh, this experience uh, that we're calling soul. So logical understanding of it. So you could say that eco-psychology is the dynamic exploration of the home of the soul or the soul of the home. I, was, I, I started thinking about it, it's like, which way round is that? Or maybe they just come together. Who knows? But it's a it's an an interesting. So this is why I sort of unpacked this word because it's such a it's quite a juicy one. I think there's lots in there. So eco psychology got some real depth to that. Eco therapy then you could say is applied eco psychology. So when when we we've got our logic. A logic of the home of the soul or the soul of the home um, we apply that to the world we apply that to our lives we apply that to the world around us uh, the word therapy itself as it says there to attend to attend so a therapist attends so this is in a sense you could say to be with um, whoever or whatever it is we're attending to so the psyche you know the word psyche isn't in that, but you could say eco-psychotherapy. Um, maybe it's just a shortened version of that. But the word is used in a slightly broader way than just that. Um, you could say to attend to the home, to the tend to the eco, to the system, the home, the system that is our home, you could say. Uh, and that can have many levels, especially if you add the word psyche in there as well. That can be quite deep so used broadly to address any activity of people relating in a positive way with nature you could say it's one way of sort of thinking of that but the way i yeah let's let's not worry about that good so let's move into the next sort of important element to this uh, if we are going to be relating to nature, we have to sort of, uh, in a sense, be, if it, you could say, attending to nature. Where, where do we find this nature? How are we going to relate to it? How are we going to do this attending, let's say? So we can't relate to anything if we're not in our body. So this is sort of a basic, you know, it's sort of obvious when you think about it. Um, how can we, if we're not, uh, it's, it's our body that is sensitive and that picks up any relating that goes on so without a body we can't do it so we have to be actually in our body to to be able to practice ecotherapy or eco psychology or eco psychotherapy so to experience our senses this is how we how we um, engage and relate so those who came to my last session with Sebastiana as well, um, 
we talked about mindfulness as a sort of uh, way of embodying ourselves. You could, you could talk, some people talk about mindfulness in a way basically synonymous with embodiment. So in a sense, our mind and our body comes together. This is the way that I would use the word mindfulness, um, bringing my mind into my body and so I can live a full, full and engaged, sensuous life, you could say. So you could also say that our body is our nature. This is, in a sense, um, the manifestation of nature. If our body is a manifestation of nature, uh, this is our direct relationship with it. To relate to our body is to relate to nature. So all of this stuff, all of these uh, realities or experiences are all weaving together now. As we, as we bring our attention into our body, we, don't own, we not only relate to our own nature, we, relate, we actually get the opportunity to relate to nature outside of us as well. So on the, other, on the flip side of that, whenever we are dissociated or disconnected from our body, we are disconnected from nature um, through our experience. Of course, we can't really be dis disconnected from nature, but our experience can be disconnected from nature. Our, our awareness, you could say, our awareness of that connection, which of course is what um, allows us to do the things that we do to nature. As a, as a culture. So our inherent connection to nature emerges when we're sensitive and I'm sure a lot of you have come across this term biophilia, uh, this natural, as we get to know our bodies and be befriend our experience in our bodies, we might well naturally notice that we are drawn towards nature, we are drawn towards uh, the natural in our environment. So in a sense, we can't really get away from that experience. Uh, of course, we wouldn't necessarily want to. Once we start to experience it, we realize that's, that's exactly what we want and probably what we've always wanted. So just to bring the word soul back in here, just to sort of add a little depth, depth to this experience. Just as our body is nature, so is our soul. So our soul is a natural part of our, um, of our being, you could say. Um, we don't have to use the word soul. I, I, all words are metaphors, really. So we're not, um, when we get to the more subtle levels of reality, we're not sort of um, talking about this maybe as a literal thing, but um, as a sort of an experience, a deep experience of ourselves and of life you could say so hopefully that if that word is uh, scary to you just uh, use something else like depth or sense of connectedness or something like that um, you could say that nature is ensouled as well so nature is alive nature is animated so if you if you know your roots to words again the word animated anima actually means soul. So to be animated literally means to be ensouled. So um, that's another quite handy word coming out of our Greek history, Greek lineage. So as we relax into connection with nature, a deeper level of being emerges. So I've sort of already mentioned really this, this uh, this, you don't really have to do anything to, to draw that out. It's more a matter of letting it, letting it happen. And as we let this happen, I've already mentioned this idea that our soul is sort of like a blueprint that emerges through time and space. And so this unfoldment is mirrored in nature. We can see in the cycles of nature, the, own, the cycles of our own unfolding. So time in nature uh, naturally is, you could say, therapeutic in that it helps us to draw out our experience and unfold ourselves in, in you could say, in a natural way. All these words start to uh, connect to each other. 
So it's co-unfoldment, co-evolution, this deeply inter interconnected process, all these deeply interconnected systems. And in a sense, uh, our thinking mind can't really grasp the depth of this experience. So as I mentioned in the mindfulness course last time, is when we let go of our thinking mind and come down into our sensuous experiencing body that we can actually start to experience the world in that, in that deeper way. So here we are sort of, sort of talking about human development. And when I say ecotherapy or any sort of therapy or attending to, it is the, in terms of humans, it's the development of us that or our emerging nature that uh, we're talking about here. So this naturally unfolds through time. When we're mindful, embodied, directly experiencing ourselves in nature. And the other element to this is we are held by curious, caring, communicative, mature adults in a safe environment. So you can start to see here how this really beautifully links into Forest School, because this is, this is exactly um, the perfect environment for a child's beginning when they're held in this way, the natural unfolding uh, is allowed to, to start to take place or maybe need to take place with less resistance than they may be experiencing in other parts of their lives potentially in a classroom, for example. So there is an identified pattern to this unfoldment. So I find it quite handy to be able to um, identify these patterns of unfoldment. And lots of people have, have played their parts in identifying this. And um, my current favorite is uh, Bill Plotkin's um, expression of this how he has expressed it i've got his book here i don't know if uh, I'll, I'll send it out anyway later but uh, it's called nature and the human soul and it's a it's a weighty tone as you might be able to see there it's quite a quite a thick one but it, it chronicles the whole emergence of the of the human soul through through life in relation to nature um, I think it's a brilliant piece of work. So in that, I'll just sort of give you a, a little bit of a taste of, of what's in that book. And I really like these sorts of images. You might not be able to see this very easily, um, but I think we're gonna, well, we're gonna share these slides so you'll get to have a look more closely at it anyway. Um, you'll see on, on the east side, of this diagram is the beginning with birth and also the end with death, uh, at least the beginning and end of the, what we call the human life anyway. And you'll notice it goes round sun, sun wise, you could say, or clockwise, uh, and it follows human development through lots of stages, through eight stages. Um, is the way that he's chosen with a different uh, what he calls in a different initiation into each part we don't have time to go into that now but uh, i'll talk a little bit about the first few parts of this first few stages of this uh, process so the innocent in the nest is, is Bill Plotkin's um, name for the first stage. And so this is what happens after, after birth, you could say, um, leading up to birth as well. But so what we're talking about, his early childhood, the stage of innocence is the sort of crux of this or the center of this. So at that point, obviously we don't have language our domain is the nest. The world in which we live is this very small uh, world, very much uh, usually very close to the to the mother um, or the one who's doing the closest raising. We 
look, listen, feel, smell everything for the first time. So this is direct experience, pure direct experience. You could say we, we are unable to label yet. We don't have any categories for labeling. So uh, that's something that evolves gradually over time. So it's, it's pure experience, you could say, pure sensual experience, uh, which is in a sense what we've already been talking about is, is quite a useful thing. In mindfulness, we would call that beginner's mind. So we have images, sense, sounds, movements in and around, inside ourselves as well as around us. We don't judge, we don't have anything, any way to judge. We just have pure curiosity, which is another uh, element of what we call of um, mindfulness. Another word for mindfulness really is that sense of curiosity that we have. We employ curiosity when we're practicing mindfulness. And we are innocence personified, you could say pure spirit, some people would say. Um, we are unquestionably in relation with everything at this stage, and everything is waiting for us to question it. So that just gives us a bit of a sense of the first stage. Second stage, the explorer in the garden. You know, as, as we mature, uh, we start to our life begins to expand, middle childhood here. So this is the stage of wonder. You, you could say this is the quality that we embody most fully at this, at this stage. Absolute wonder at the world as we go out and start to explore a little bit further. So we're developing ways to engage with nature and culture. Our domain is the garden, so our, our immediate environment, you could say, that our immediate environment. Explore, mimic, and image new things. We're using imagination a lot as, as children in this stage. Of course, we're engaging with much more than just humans as well, if we get the chance. Well, even if we don't get the chance to engage with nature, we're still engaging with um, what we can find really around us. Language and biomimicry are amazing new tools we have to play with the world around us. <clears throat> so often I remember playing, or I particularly remember right now, uh, pretending to be a lion at different times or jumping around on bales like a mountain goat. So all sorts of biomimicry going on. Naming things in relation to our cultural paradigm. So we start to learn a naming system here. We start to sort of uh, get to know the world of our parents. The, mostly it's our parents at this point, really. We're learning about our culture through them. All the, all the um, adults that are around us. Play is paramount, wonder is primary. So life is all about discovering family through our cultural ideas and nature through, the, through our biodiversity. We start to build things like forts, climbing trees, we talk with squirrels or whatever we can find to talk to, whatever's willing to sit still long enough, we'll talk to them, even if they're not. Stage three then, whistle-stop tour of um, human development here. Uh, so we're already up to the thespian. You can sort of imagine what the thespian might be. We're into sort of our early adolescence here. Stage of creative fire, you could say. Just imagine that, that period of life where everything is so, or fire I think is a really good word for it. Um, concerned with securing an authentic social self. This is where the center of gravity is more with, the, um, with our peers around us. The greater environment, our, our world is beginning to expand into out into society now, beyond the family. You could say our, our ego is beginning to, our, um, is beginning to really sort of appear here, as in what I mean by that is our sense of self uh, is beginning to be delineated from other people's sense of self. In a sense, uh, we've always been different in our character and personality, but um, 
we start to develop a personal sense of what that is more fully here. Peer pressure is primary, sexuality is starting to show up a little bit um, as we enter this stage and just evolves through this period. Um, so, but peer pressure is sort of center here. We really care about what other people think about us, whether we let on to that or not. Sometimes it feels too dangerous to let on that, to that reality, um, depending on what's going on for us. We seek confirmation through our uh, societal paradigm. We, we want to be confirmed by those around us. Our curiosity starts to shift towards sexuality. We start to explore what that might mean. Gradually becoming more authentic in relation to others. And not just people, but animals and other things as well. The animate universe, you could say, in terms of the soul. And just to say, I think it's um, important to sort of note here, really, that the majority of people in Western society stop here. This is basically what our culture has uh, generally offers us through the television, through uh, different forms of media. Um, most people are preoccupied with what other people think about them um, and trying to sort of uh, trying to play the game well enough to be accepted. Uh, so this is this is basically where a lot of people get stuck. Just to sort of note that, I think it's, I think it's quite handy to know. And, and so in a sense, I'm thinking this is the importance of the role of Forest School is, is that we can sort of support young people to move into this in a healthy way and, and maybe through this into, into further stages. And I think there's probably a lot of people on this call who, could, uh, who are probably already engaged in um, helping us move beyond these different stages. So the fourth stage then, this is the, this is sort of the, the, the place where everything can shift into sort of a new phase of or way of being in our culture. This is the thing that uh, is going to, or is already really, um, unfolding um, in our world to, to help us move forwards out of our current crisis as a culture. Late adolescence here. So the stage of mystery and darkness. So late adolescence, if you think about it, um, quite a few young people are starting to wear dark things at this time. Quite a, quite a few people are, are, are drawn to um, darkness going out at night time even. Uh, uh, it doesn't have to be that literal, um, but different people find their different ways to it differently. So we're concerned with understanding the great mystery. Lots of wonder in terms of um, exploring the world in a more internal or sort of, you could say almost esoteric way or uh, sort of slightly, slightly deeper way, you could say. Our domain is the cocoon, what we think of as the cocoon. So this in a sense, uh, if you think of what a cocoon is, it, it's like where we wrap ourselves up before we're uh, reborn as something different. So a mystical, mythical, transformative place, place within the unconscious realm. For me, just to say for me how that sort of emerged was I left home and moved to the United States. Um, I was started to explore whole, whole new cultures, whole new worlds. Um, so I started to wander, but I was still very internal. Uh, at that time. So I, I was very still not, not formed in the cocoon, you could say. And I think this is where lots of young people find themselves as they go out into the world, starting to wander and look for new ways of being, exploring ways to let go, you could say letting go of the old, letting go of family, you could say, as, as we try to reach out and get into the world. Uh, you could say that uh, family feels too limiting at this, at this point in life trying lots of new things, trying altering states of consciousness, alcohol, drugs, um, whatever we can find really, all sorts of new experiences we had in the world. Mystery is becoming our essential guide 
learning how to open up to serendipity, coincidence, becoming more sensitive to these things, going with the flow, you could say. Exploration is paramount. Hearing the call of the wild is primary. Heeding that call is sometimes, yeah, sometimes we're a bit um, holding back on that in this stage. Stretching comfort zones, breaking mental paradigms. We're talking about in the, in the healthy sense here, um, in a healthy context. And becoming a creature that has the capacity for soul initiation. So this is the point where we start to realize who we really are. And in a, in a mature culture and in a mature way of working with young people, we might support them to find this psyche as a gift, uh, psyche as a gift to ourselves, first of all. And as we realize who we are, it becomes a gift to the, to the rest of the world, which is what a soul-centered soul -centered society would do. We live our lives as a gift to the community around us. So, given our short time, I'm just going to whip through this last four stages. Early adulthood, we take our soul and we start to learn how to embody it. How do we embody our gift to the world? You know, that could be through being a, a forest school teacher, for example. The artisan in the wildwood is late adulthood, where we've perfected what we came here to do, what our soul is here to do. We've perfected that and we've become good at offering it to the world. The master in the grove is maybe the level we get to when we start to support others to do the same, when we're supporting others to, to give their gift back to the world. And the last the sage in the mountain cave. This is obviously um, very few people in our culture ever reach this stage uh, where somebody can sit back and in a sense share what they've got almost in the silence. You can feel their wisdom coming from, from them in their own silence uh, with just very, very few words. So hopefully that makes some sort of sense, at least intuitively, to you. What I'd like to do now is just offer a little practice of mindfulness. So I'm going to stop sharing at this point to come back to the car. So there's lots of, lots of information there. And what I'd like to do is, is uh, give us a chance just to embody a little bit of that. I want to give us a little short practice um, to see what, what it is that I'm talking about. So what I invite you to do is just to sit comfortably wherever you are. If you feel comfortable with it, you could either close your eyes or just lower your gaze to just reduce the input, reducing the visual input to yourself and just allowing your attention to come into your body and out of your head. You might feel your feet on the floor. You might feel your bottom on the chair, whatever's holding you up here, just getting a sense of the weight of your body feeling yourself embodied and becoming aware of your breathing. Just noticing what it feels like to breathe, the sensations of breathing. If that's okay for you, just feeling that sense. Notice that you're taking in oxygen. With each breath you're taking in oxygen. So that, that oxygen that you're taking in right now has come from the trees in your neighborhood. It's come from the grasses, the plants in your house directly. That's, this is not just esoteric, this is, this is reality. 
Some of it's probably come from plankton under the sea, in the rivers. So this breath here is coming, directly connecting you to the plants around you. As you breathe out, you're breathing out carbon dioxide, feeding the plants around you very, very directly. Getting a sense of that connection. Feeling the connection with those plants around you giving and receiving. So being aware of the body sitting, sitting on the earth. Whatever you're sitting on is sitting on the earth. The chair, on the floor, on the house, on the earth. Gravity's force is what's keeping you here, which is a direct link to the earth. There's no, with no earth, no gravity. Really getting that sense of your connectedness to the earth here. Through your body and gravity. And moving on now to this experience of sound. Whistle stop tour of the senses here. Exploring sound. You might hear nature sounds. You might be hearing human sounds. You might be hearing mechanical sounds. Sound. connects us with the outer world and it connects us with the inner world, linking both aspects of reality. Sound is vibrating air coming to the ears. You might even be able to hear your own breathing. maybe becoming aware of the ecosystem in which you are sitting here, inside this house, inside this office, inside this building, or maybe you're lucky enough to be sitting outside. Wherever you are, you're sitting inside an ecosystem more or less overtly connected to it right now. Being aware of that ecosystem in which you are sitting. Life is happening all around. The birds outside, the weather patterns, maybe some rain, maybe some clouds. Aware of the season, time of day, Noticing, maybe noticing, thinking or imagining where the sun is right now. Remembering that we're always sitting within a wider system. So from this place of awareness of our wider system, I invite you now to Turn your attention to the body again and just notice how your body is reacting to this awareness. Feeling the warmth of your body and any sensations and noticing if any images have arisen in your mind. And we're going to shift to external experience now with your paper, with your drawing implements. 
whatever it as is that you've brought with you to make marks with just feeling into keeping your attention inside your body and letting yourself intuitively make some marks on your paper as you come out and just gently opening your eyes maybe not reconnecting with the screen so much but as uh, coming to your paper and seeing if you're drawn to any particular colors if you brought colors if you don't have colors you could just reach for a pen or a pencil there's nothing you have to achieve here there's nothing you have to show to anybody else but just seeing what marks want to come it doesn't have to be look in any particular way we're just doing some mark making in a sense of a sort of a spontaneous way it might look like something it might not look like something letting it be an intuitive process just remembering our relationship with nature and the world around us our own connection to our body what's our relationship with nature here how is that uh, wanting to express itself through our hand through our images through our shapes and colors. And not worrying if, if nothing's coming to you, that's fine as well. If it's easier for you, you could uh, write down a list of words that uh, that are coming to you uh, that maybe through that little meditation, if there are any particular images and words that were coming to you, that's fine as well. Every once in a while, connecting back with your body, feeling what it feels like to move your arm and your hand like this. Letting yourself be surprised by what comes out. You could say letting yourself be playful. Having a little bit of fun with it. And just have another minute to 
see if you can find a way to finish up what you're what you're doing. And letting yourself finish there. You can always do more later if that feels like you'd like to do that. Um, and you know, as with any exercise, it, it went as it went. You either managed to engage with it or not. It doesn't, doesn't matter. It uh, was an experience. So, just to say that that's uh, engaging with that sort of practice is something that I would do or I do do with uh, with adults in term and where I put that in the in the developmental process really is is uh, around the sort of soul awareness I would say if we're going to use Bill Plotkin's terms sort of uh, aware uh, becoming in a sense allowing the soul to express itself or some deeper some deeper process to express itself if we can to the extent that we can let our thinking mind or our judgmenting judgmental mind or uh, to to the extent we can let that go and let something else come through is the extent to which we may be able to um, touch into something and that getting playful with arts is a wonderful way to do that and if we, the more we can weave nature into that, the better uh, to allow that uh, instinctive, our instinctive nature, you could say, to come to come through. Um, so that's sort of uh, that's the main the main elements of what I had to to offer tonight. Of course, what I usually do as a when I'm facilitating something like that as a therapist, attending attending to somebody's process, is uh, I, I open it up to people, anyone who wanted to share anything about their experience with within that. And I don't know if we have that facility here or if that how that would work. I don't know how if the if the goblin uh, Nick in the background there. <laughs> as any i can i can open it up so people can unmute themselves if they wish to share um i'm aware we've got we've, we've got about six minutes um before we before we start separating yeah. out again um so, so maybe if we sorry if we grab a couple of people if you want to uh, use a reaction if you look down at the bottom of your screen there's a little smiley face with a plus above it if you click on that then um, if um, Robert, if you want to have a look through and pick somebody, and then they can unmute themselves, if that's how you want to do it, or yeah, does anyone want to share anything about their process there, or what? Did, was anyone surprised by what came out, or in, enjoyed it in some way, or or just wants to share their image you know, in front of how many people we got on this call? Some ridiculous amount, but. Uh, I'll go. Um, hi, I'm Catherine, and today is the, my eldest daughter's 16th birthday. And what came out for me, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, it's the light's not great. I was thinking about your talking about um, life systems, and I came out with this spiral, mm. which wow. was, was my life journey with the start in the middle. And then it kind of split off with two pieces coming away from it. And then there were some bumps in there for, for pregnancies. So for me, it was just really, um, it helped me come to some acceptance that she's 16. Um, she doesn't want to be at home with her family. She wants to be out with her friends. And it's mm -hmm. kind of as part of this spiral and just needing to accept and let, let her go. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thanks so much for sharing that. It really, 
appreciate that because it's such a gift to all of us. It really helps to illustrate um, illustrate this ability to step back and get a bigger perspective on on things that might be you could say you know lots of parents struggle with with that sort of letting go process and in a sense that's a part of our own soul journey the letting go and element so i really appreciate you sharing that thank you thank you very much uh i think i think well, there was just lots of spirals coming up in the chat room just so you know i just wondered does phil in his writings allude to spirals some things spinning out and then spinning back in that do you, was that you, did you say do, does he does he yes yeah um i can't think of anything specific i'm sure he it's such a universal image isn't it that's um it comes up in all cultures and mythologies and uh you know and it's embedded in our universe isn't it or we're we're in one aren't we we're right in the middle of one in our solar mm. system um so yeah it's a makes a lot of sense there are uh, there's about three questions that have come up i don't know whether we've got great let's move into three minutes let's so move into that. there's one on it it's just uh, that started off quite early in your talk which is about is there a difference between mindfulness and conscious learning oh conscious learning well i think they're closely related uh, my perspective on that would be that they are uh, very closely related I would say that uh, mindfulness is becoming conscious uh, of our experience in a sense um, if mindfulness is awareness in the body in our in our senses and learning happens through the senses so uh, without mindfulness conscious learning couldn't happen mm -hmm. so I would say that they're intimately related uh, in that sense yeah it's a great question um... And then there's another one, um, which sort of, well, there's two that are sort of a more, almost the same thing. One, one was, how, what does really help us move if we're stuck in stage three, generally in Western society? Yeah. What helps us move into stage four? What helps us across that threshold? Um, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, fantastic question. The, um, we have to what's required is is wandering you could say it's as implied as the wander in the cocoon um that wonderful image of the of letting go of what's known this is sort of the all-important element uh, bill plotkin has a book called soul craft if anyone wants to sort of really dive into that stage soul craft is about that transition uh, it's a fantastic handbook to uh to make that transition so we have to basically let go of what's known and uh, see what comes. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's a hell of a process, you know. Um, and actually the, the word hell comes from that because uh, that transition involves a diving down into hell before we re-emerge into who we are on a deeper level once we've discovered who we really are, you could say. Mm. Um, How's that for a really short answer? <laughs> so really face the shadow, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, you could say really face our shadows and be willing to dive into that. Um, and obviously the metaphor there with the cocoon is, is for the butterfly to come out. We have to go in the cocoon. And as I'm sure we all know, metamorphosis is that um, in the cocoon, we literally turn to mush. Well, you know, in a sense, the, the caterpillar turns to mush. It doesn't just grow wings. Mm. So this is this is the, the diving down into the unknown. Yeah, into the yeah. deep unknown. So there's a couple of questions just on um, how we might introduce some of that therapeutic practice into our practice. Um, mm. Anything from, I don't know, the sorts of training that is available to the very, I'd say light, because it's, um, it's a therapeutic process, isn't it, for a school? Yeah. Um, I'm often, I often say, look, I am not a therapist, however, this is a therapeutic community, but it's how Brilliant. do we introduce 
things and hold the space so that people are open because i get from what you said it's about being open yeah yeah, uh, yeah. and and letting the natural world speak to us in that way in terms of where the stage of development we're at yeah so it's just what sort of simple things might we incorporate yeah uh, for for the young people yeah yeah uh, our biggest to the two biggest gifts are ourselves and as well as and the nature and our uh, supporting them to engage with nature so it's like uh, to give the gift of ourselves that means doing our own work on ourselves so we we really you know a lot of people get caught in the desire to give to others but to have something to give we have to really look after ourselves so uh, learning mindfulness learn doing your therapy doing your inner work um doing your own getting to know yourself your triggers makes you a better container if if someone's going to go into a cocoon they need a good solid container to become mush in so mm -hmm. <laughs> um and so that's our job really to hold that space um uh, there's so many things we could say about that, but uh, I think we all yeah. are at different places in terms of what we need for our own development to make ourselves a good container. So that I don't know whether you got we might have, just for one more question. A few people have been asking about training and how do we, if we want to dive into ecotherapy work, how do you go start on that path? Um, for me, it started with, uh, well, on my training course, but my training course was in the States, in the United States, um, when I was living over there. In this country, there's various, there's various people around who do bits and pieces. A woman called Haley Marshall does ecotherapy. I'm just wondering if the best thing to do is to send out a little list of a little list of things tomorrow i think we're going to send a, yeah. a resource list tomorrow I th that's probably the best way to, to yeah. do this rather than great if that's okay yep super um there is the um therapeutic skills for outdoor practitioners is uh, that comes out of manchester uni yeah right which um is a yeah it's a really good course um yeah not too long. <laughs> um, it doesn't. Uh, you're not qualified as a therapist, uh, but it's a it's a great introduction to it. Right. Yeah. 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 There's, um, for example, Bill Plotkin does training, um, and there's people who runs his trainings over here. Yeah. Um, I know there's that mentor work. What's that guy's name? <laughs> John Young. Yeah. John Young. People. A lot of people like him. I don't know much about his work. Yeah. Um, but it's worth looking. I put Bill's um, website up. The animus. Um, the animus value. Great stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah that, that's good. That's good. Read, read his books. Read John Young's books. Uh, I'll give a. I'll send an. I'll send a list of books that. Uh, um, I almost brought my pile of ecotherapy books up, but I was like, oh, that's not much use. I'll, I'll just send it out to you. <laughs> Great. No. Um, so, I guess we've you've, we've reached our nine o'clock spot. Uh, are we, were you going to give people a chance to sort of divide off, Louise? Was it Louise? Yeah. So um, we normally say you know we have this core hour, and we recognise that some people you know an hour is all they can give to us this evening. So if that's the case, thank you very much. We're happy that you spent this time with us. Um, but those of you who wish to join us up until half past, we can split into uh, two, two groups. So if you'd like to continue talking about ecotherapy with Robert, um, or if you have any more questions, we're going to stay in this main room. Um, but if you'd like to join John in the breakout room for sharing of all sorts of different things happen there, yeah, you'll join the breakout room and as um as nick said earlier if you end up in the wrong room 
you can look for a button at the bottom of the screen um, which says if you, if you end up in the breakout room with John and you want to come back to us in this main room, you click uh, leave breakout room so you'll be able to move yourself into the right room but um, I will also say a big thank you to Robert at this point as well for such a stimulating talk um, as well. But um, we'll wave goodbye to anybody who's going. <laughs> bye bye to anybody who's going. And then um, Nick, would you do the magic sp spitting us into two groups, please? Certainly will do. So um, I'm going to open up the breakout rooms now. If you want to stay here, stay here. If you want to go there, go there. Uh, if you find yourself in the wrong place, as Louise said, you can come back. If you end up in the main room and you want to go somewhere else and you want to go into the breakout room and can't, if you drop me a message in the chat, um, I will come and find you and I will put you in the room um, myself. Okay. Um, so here we go. So, so, what do people want to talk about? I'm just wondering again the best technical way of doing this as to whether to have people unmute themselves or whether people want to type in the chat bar. Or I, I find it usually works okay to to just unmute yourself and and say something. If two people start at once, then someone will go first and someone will go second. And, but, yeah, you, uh, everybody's now got the option to unmute themselves. Okay. Um, just to bear in mind that the um, the other room isn't record recorded, but this question and answer session is, so the the cameras will continue to roll. Cameras rolling. Okay. Cameras rolling. No pressure, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Time to perform. <laughs> oh yeah. What uh, what draws you guys back here? Or were you hoping someone else was going to ask a question? Or make a statement? Yeah, you don't. I'll, I'll bet a lot of you know more than I do. So just uh, tell me something about your experience or your knowledge. I, um, I am really working in forest school setting, even though I'm forest school trained. Uh, I haven't had that glorious opportunity yet i tend to do the more formal education work but we we'd really like what i really like to um push mindfulness in what we do and try to work it through all as many sessions as possible to work in mental health and well-being mm. so within a bit of a more formal outdoor education session i'm wondering how i can sneak in something like this without turning everyone off <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not for everyone, and I don't want teenagers no. going, "What on earth are you talking about?" Yeah, so it's yeah, how yeah. to set it up so they buy into it at the beginning, and part of that is probably my own confidence, as you were saying that if I've done it and I know it works, I will carry myself well when I introduce it. But still, some tips would be really handy. Yeah, I mean, I, I trust. I, I I think I trust you with with that sort of. Um, knowledge because you know in a sense it's 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 one's own enthusiasm that's infectious isn't it um mm. the I'm just trying to think of anything in particular i mean there's all sorts of little activities that mm. that you do all the all the usual activities it's with mindfulness it's the quality of um it's the quality of attention you you bring with it if you experience wonder some of them will experience wonder mm. and obviously developmentally a lot of them are sort of not that into not that into adults anyway so um <laughs> doing group stuff with themselves is probably also a good thing or doing stuff on their own some i know that i've had a lot of experience with young people who just want to do go off and do something on their own and giving them a way of doing that um Uh, yeah. And I was wondering about whether I could beg beg ten minutes or so at the beginning of of each day to just do a sit spot, to to just to chill people out before we get into the main session. And that's yeah. something. 
yeah. um, whether it becomes a, a more of a guided sit spot so a bit more of meditation like you were doing I don't know whether I'd get away with that because when they're fresh off the coach they're all full of enthusiasm and yeah probably just going to be chatting and not tuning in but I'd really like to just calm them down and tune them in before I do anything else yeah so that for me there's something about um usually what helps with that there's a, another practice I have called sense and savor so finding something that you really like the look of and really looking at it um so there might be something some sort of activity that would involve really focusing attention on something focusing attention inside i think is often quite hard for some young people unless you can dress it up in a particular way but um with really young people you can get them to watch uh you can shake a little jar and watch watch the stuff settle uh, the watch the sort of dirt and stuff settle down there's something really quite fascinating about that it's a bit like watching a snow globe sort of gradually settle mm. um, uh, doing something active that involves focus you know that you know there's something like um the, the thing that comes to me is is archery but you know in a sense but there's there's other games and things that you can play that uh that involve focus and attention on it just like a scavenger hunt something like that that would uh, involve attention yeah i i don't know how helpful. Helpful. I'm not sure how helpful i'm going to be in this one <laughs> that is helpful because it means i'm doing a lot of that already <laughs> i think see, I th see that's the thing i i think i think everyone on this call probably has got all the skills you need it's it's, it's the confidence and it's the building your own ability to to have confidence with it and to pay really clear attention because that's infectious and people know if you're telling them to do something you don't do yourself it's a, um that, that they pick that up too <laughs> brilliant thank you that's that is really good thanks for bringing that question and point hey uh, hi robert Thank you for this evening. I'm, I'm a forest school practitioner, but for the last couple of years, I've been involved in the Branching Out Ecotherapy Project up yeah. in Scotland. What's that? Um, yeah, so you're making that transition from children to adults. Mm. Um, we're finding one of the main problems is actually persuading professionals that yeah. uh, ecotherapy actually works and that it's cost effective um, so that they refer people to us. I mean, anybody can refer people to us. It can be doctors, um, you know, mental health support teams, mm -hmm. you know, any sort of support workers, anybody involved um, with mental health services can refer somebody. But trying yeah. to persuade people that this actually works yeah, yeah. Um, can be tricky. Have you any yes, experience? I know. I've, <laughs> I've, had to, I've had to write funding proposals and things like that as well. And that's why I have terms such as mindfulness, which is which people really like. Um, I'm, I'm assuming you've you've probably seen the ecotherapy research that was done um, by the Essex is it Essex University, I believe. There was research done formally there, um, so that's that's really useful. That's got lots of really good hard data in it. Um, Mind, mm -hmm. mental health charity Mind, e yeah. is it called Eco Minds? Eco Minds. They've got some great resources online. Um, you might have come across that as well. So, but uh, those are the first things that come to my mind. Those are the things that I put in my <laughs> my funding goods <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, and, and obviously, we will we'll also have to persuade the clients. Yeah. To stay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Especially if it's well, winter time and they come along the first session and it's minus ten or whatever outside. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's uh, I I do I found when I've done stuff like this is like <clears throat> meeting indoors and building relationships can help me has helped me in the past if it's cold and winter, but if they've already got the relationship with you, they I think they would tend to follow you. Where where do you do? I don't know. We, we just tend to do it all outside. 
Gives, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's 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 fine as well. But I, starting in the winter will be tricky, I imagine. But <laughs> it can be. Having a fire, having stuff to eat. Yeah, we we make a fire. We we cook on the fire. Yeah. All that sort of stuff is is loved by. It's sort of it's just in your in the bones, and like once it captures an imagination. Good storytelling is something else actually that I haven't mentioned yet. Uh, mm -hmm. Good storytelling is uh, young people tend to love if you just do that mm -hmm. at their their level. Yeah, well, we're 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 dealing with people of, of all ages here, but I don't think the the desire to hear a good story ever goes. Yeah, indeed, indeed, that's uh, and th and that sort of just that links in the mythological, you could say, soul level if you want to, into place their so soul and place come together in a story don't they and, mm -hmm. and it, it evokes the imagination which is the faculty of the soul which um engages engages on all levels immediately music drumming um mm. making sounds build building stuff all of these all of these things that everyone on this call already does just don't underestimate the power of it um, but yeah it's uh, it is fine hard to hard to find the um these evidence for it isn't it to to persuade yeah yeah i think when people are so used to turn into pharmaceutical sort of medical sources of help trying to get them to change their opinion yeah. of that can be tricky yeah yeah, yeah. I, I think it's getting there though yeah yeah behavioral stuff you know there's there's some research around um what's it called wilderness therapy in the states there's research around that as well so yeah good thank, thank you thank oh you. yeah thank you yeah <laughs> great stuff it's uh it's best if it would be even better if we could all talk at once really because then there's so much more knowledge on this call i know but uh yeah any other thoughts? Hello. Emerging want... How do I get to speak? Or am I speaking? You are. You're yes. speaking. Oh, hello. You're live. You're live. Uh, yeah, no, really interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just wondering about, say you've got a group of kids and you've kind of gone into mindfulness, done a meditation, etc. gone down that route, because I, I do quite a bit of that with yeah. small groups. Um, and then just... <laughs> My tricky point is when I go headlong into coming out of the meditation and somebody whacks me with a disclosure, which is very, mm. can be very tricky. Now, how, if you were in that situation, obviously you're then trying to handle bringing people back together. I'm, I'm not a therapist in any, you know, I, yeah. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. Teacher, it's, you know, I've read a bit, but that's it. Um, yeah. In that situation, how do you kind of, take that person to deal with that and then deal with whatever's the main group at the same time because it, it yeah. can be really upheat and an upheaval kind of having to so you're process. you're on your own in that context are you you're on your own yeah. as an adult yeah yeah i mean quite often there'll be another person there but they won't be trained it will just be a teaching assistant of in general um and so they aren't usually i mean they're competent but you know what i mean but yeah Usually Maybe if we've got probably. activities going, I mean, yes, I can obviously leave the children with them to sort it out, but it's always difficult if you're in the middle of leading the session or a kind of a, a lead meditation to then leave that to kind of deal with mm -hmm. something that comes up. And I'm just wondering from a kind of deeper therapeutic point of view, how would you kind of deal with that? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, it is tricky because in a sense you can't really, uh, there's something about... Uh, it sort of depends on the disclosure in a sense, doesn't it? In a, um, but in a sense, if they've been holding on to it up until that point, there's something a, they could probably manage to hold it for the rest of the time. Yeah, um, so it. it's yeah. like something about just saying like, wow, thanks. Thank you so much for telling me, really acknowledging that I know that's a big thing to say, to say that. So um, let's, let's talk about it at the tea break or um, yeah, yeah. afterwards or a bit later if you can just hold on to that for me um or some you know something like that that would yeah, um, no, just just the usual things i just wondered if there was <laughs> if anyone had kind of got any art you know um or yourself had kind of any 
kind of strategies of particularly how you would deal with that um because sometimes it can end up being quite upsetting for everyone to see what i mean if there's young folk as well right so they've shared it with the whole it. group and, yes. yeah, yeah yeah and i'm not talking about one-to-one um i'm talking about in front of the whole group and so then yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, we're in a I, I'm sort of uh, just um, i think i think that basic um that basic thing this is this is why i said doing your own work is so important yeah 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 because the more the more one feels at peace within oneself um there's always going to be something that's going to throw us and that's just the way life yeah, yeah. is but uh, the more work i've done the less things will throw me the more yeah. sort of uh, so in a sense then everyone's going to be looking to you aren't they to to see how you react yeah so yeah so that's the the more grounded you stay and the more you can say oh this is okay i can we can hold this don't worry about it yeah 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 um, i was, was just thinking who, yeah oh, yes yeah, i was going to say something great um, yes i i was just thinking that maybe um if it's something that's happening quite frequently that you could as you introduce the meditation perhaps explain that sometimes feelings um and things you know things that you want to do, there might be things that come up yeah. and that if things come up for you then have like an allocated space or time when they can bring it up bring with you back, bring it back yeah no yeah, yeah. No, that's a good idea i hadn't so yeah, I mean, we always, we always kind of talk about group. stuff to start with um but then I mean, I mean it's only happened a couple of times to be fair but it's just been you know after each time i mean even that's even after explaining about because quite often we say that you know things will come out from people and we've all experienced different things they're quite uh groups are quite trauma traumatized yeah. but not if you get what i mean um yeah. in of social deprivation um yeah. yeah and the other effects that come with that Yes, um, that would be naturally yeah. traumatic. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. So I think that's a really good point because if when you're working with groups like that in particular, or of course trauma can be anywhere, but with a group like that where it's going to be more um, more prevalent, I think it, it that what you've said there, uh, Catherine, was really really insightful in terms of uh, setting things up to say you to, to normalize that you know this sort of thing can bring stuff out which is, yes. which is yeah. fine and which is great that's good that's good that that happens and in order to hold that well um just uh, tell us about it afterwards or something you know in a sense there mm -hmm. thank you great thank you thanks caroline catherine that was catherine who gave us that insight can I just come back to the um, when you mentioned the, the wilderness therapy type thing? Yeah. Because uh, I found a, a few of these uh, organisations, and I was trying to sort of, you know, contrast and compare to eco therapy, yes, as, as yes. well as as well as trying to work out how it sort of fits into forest school. And uh, one of them that uh, I could actually send somewhere is, in case people want to do it, uh, the will. Hey, actually sorts of talks about all sorts of different things including forest school but then sort of says but if you really want to engage with the children you have to sort of do it like this as it were which i thought <laughs> yeah. well that's maybe possibly a bit disingenuous but anyway yeah. um but i just wondered if, if you'd heard of these two organizations uh there might be others but they were just the the first so, ones that i found yeah. and how well, it all sort of fits together with what you're doing I know about wilderness therapy in general. I mean, I know a little bit about wilderness therapy in general in terms of the model is quite different in terms of, um, well, from an ecotherapy perspective, uh, that can be um, in the past, at least. This is based on at least sort of 10 years ago anyway. Uh, most, of the, most of the people who would do the so-called wilderness therapy were not therapists. So, uh, that was a sort of a, I found that a little, well, most of us in the field will found that a bit dodgy um, in terms of their training around how to deal with trauma and stuff like that. Uh, so there's something about this term therapeutic, not being a therapist, but being therapeutic. 
Um, but the, the danger obviously in those things is, is it's very powerful to go and spend time out in the wilderness for long periods of time. Um, that can be very powerful, which can be very destabilizing for someone who's already experienced a lot of trauma, like uh, Jessica was saying a little while ago. Um, so that's, there's dangers, but if it's held well, I mean, in a sense, you could say there's, it's a, it's a brilliant thing. Um, it'd be hard to hard to say anything against it if it if it's held well but that's just i would say that any of these organizations one would one should ask about their their training specifically in how to handle trauma and how do they manage therapeutic needs in any in any given situation well this one's some... actually this one's actually advertising i think it's a, a level three award in wilderness therapy um so that's quite interesting yeah I would be interested to see what their credentials are around. I think it's called the EQS or something, the organisation. Therapy, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I guess that's my little sort of little mm. bit of warning. I don't want to write. I don't want to write wilderness therapy off by any stretch because a lot of people have been helped a lot by it, and just to, just to just to be a little bit careful around around it to make sure everybody's doing the right thing. Just want to make sure that um, Claire gets a chance. I think I saw Claire try to, try to jump in. It, I, I just wanted to say that, it, again, like everybody else, it was a really interesting talk. It, to me, what it shows is a model for education because quite often I think we're trying to get children to do things that they're not ready for. And looking at this model, it makes me, I've been a teacher for 20 years and a trainee for a school educator at the moment. And it makes me understand more why children aren't able to cope with the things that we're exposing to them, exposing them to in school, because both on a, a developmental medal, a level and this sort of eco-psychology -psych, yeah. eco level, uh, they can't, you know, it just completely goes against nature uh, it does. For, yeah. for us to expect them to do a lot of the things we expect them to do. Yeah. So yeah. I, the way I want to take this forward in my practice is um, to try and think of a way. I, I don't know it's a big thing to be able to do, but it makes a huge lot of sense to me. It's, yeah, I, I've, yeah. I, and I, I've had one child who's 18 now, and as I saw him grow up, I've seen him through going through the stages, and he's probably coming out of three and going into four, and um, yeah, yeah, uh, and understand all the things that you were talking about. So I think even from a even from a, a parent's perspective, it's really interesting to. Even if I wasn't doing anything to do with forest schools or a teacher, it'd be really interesting to be much more aware of these levels. And yes, you know, it's okay. yes. in a sense, it's okay that your child's going a bit bonkers for a while. It makes you feel yeah. more relaxed because they're meant to. Yeah, meant that, to indeed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd be so worried if they weren't. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So it's um, you know, it's just another. It was great. Anyway, thank you. Really enjoyed Wonderful. it. Wonderful. Yeah. So it sort of yeah confirmed some stuff for you. And yes. Yeah. And it's it is unfortunate that uh, our uh, schools aren't really geared in this sort of way. That's as you say. That's uh, that is unfortunate. And it and in a sense that's uh, that's the opportunity that we have who who have the awareness, especially with forest school. What an opportunity to to just bring in a bit of good stuff. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so that is 9.30, I believe. Um, I don't know if Louise is... Well, normally, <laughs> being with John, is um, they normally join us for some collective ending. Where Big hurrah. A big just, hurrah, or, or sometimes I'm just letting the song. lady finish her point. <laughs> okay, <laughs> she's mid flow. I don't want to cut her off. All right, I've, I've given her a warning. <laughs> <laughs> so ca carry on, and I'll let you know when they're coming back in. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, the um, the main things that I just to blow my own trumpet just briefly is I do I run mindfulness in nature 
weekends and things as I mentioned so if, if that's something anyone wants to to dive more into you'd have to come all the way to Norfolk to do it but or bring me somewhere else I'm going to start running it in Czech Republic which is where my wife is from as well so if anyone happens to be in Czech Republic or nearby <laughs> southern Germany would work um, that sort of thing but yeah it's uh, it's really nice to be here and, and sort of um, hear everybody's stories it would be great if we could hear like all the little bits and pieces that everybody's doing and probably quite big bits of pieces i'd imagine as well um, it's uh, an inspiring group to be a part of i think i'm sure we'll all agree they're on their way back here they come i just saw the numbers <laughs> climbing rapidly Just right. as everybody's coming back into the room, just to say a massive thank you, Robert, for, for doing this webinar and, and the mindfulness one that you did last month as well. I think, um, you know, as forest school practitioners, I, I've noticed one of the skills of a forest school practitioner is kind of knowing various bits of theory and kind of plugging it into where it needs to be. Um, you know, based on the learners that we're working with and the needs. And, uh, you know, our forest school training, we often cover different learning theories. But they're often quite focused on cognitive development or social and emotional development. So hearing a model today, which is about soul development of a human, I think is something that could be really enriching for our practice. And, you know, it's something else to draw on when we're working with the people we're working with. So a big thank you, Robert um welcome. you're very welcome what a pleasure <laughs> and um a big thank you for everyone for being here this evening and, and giving up uh, uh an hour and a half of your time um john have you got something that we might yeah. fit together i've with? got a little song i just that came to mind when robert's well in robert's opening when you were talking about just going back to that original meaning of ecos, oikos, home. Mm, excellent. Because so, I think part of the whole therapy thing is just feeling at home and in this community of the human and non-human all together. Um, that's what I get from forest school, having been with groups for a long, long, long time. And it does feel like home. So this is called This Is Home. Some of you might know this song. So I'll sing it through couple of times then we'll go through line by line um, and then we'll all do it together it's a very simple song so you'll need to mute yourselves so you can just sing to your heart's content doesn't matter how whether you can sing or not and then right at the end we might just unmute all together and it's like a cacophony so um it goes like this uh i learned this um on forest school camp. I don't know if people come across forest school camps which have been going for years and years and years and years and years and years. And years. Uh, and singing is a big part of forest school camp. But, um, been going since the 1950s, even before then. So, this is home where I belong in this breath in this heart this is home where I belong in this voice, in this song. So that's the song, very simple. So I'll just sing the first line and you can all sing it with me a couple of times, then the second, then the third, and we'll go like that. And just sing Janet home. <laughs> This is home where I belong, okay? This is home where I belong, again. This is home where I belong. Got that? Good. Okay, here it goes. In this breath. In this heart, again, in this breath, in this heart, we'll put those two together. This is home where I belong, 
in this breath, in this heart. Got that? Good. Now the next bit goes, same first line. This is home. Then it goes up. Where I belong. This is home. Where I belong. Again. This is home. Where I belong. In this voice. In this voice, in this voice, in this song. So we'll just sing that last bit again, starting from this is home. This is home where I belong, in this voice. In this song again, this is home where I belong. In this voice, in this song. We'll stop the beginning, we'll sing it a few times, and then I'll say I'm mute and we'll just sing it all together and we'll say goodbye. Okay. This is home where I belong in this breath, in this heart. This is home where I belong in this voice. See you in a couple of weeks when it's play and therapy and all of that stuff. Look out for notices, um, and there'll be some notices going about out for the two August webinars.